Welcome YouTubers to another episode in my Grammar Hero series. In this video, I'm going to work out 16 practice test questions that should closely mirror what you should expect to see in the mechanical comprehension subtest of both the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, that is the ASVAB, as well as the PICAT. On the actual ASVAB, you'll have 20 minutes to answer these 16 questions. So if you want to time yourself as you take this practice test, uh, you can go ahead and do so. Uh, of course, in order to get the most out of this video, you'll want to pause the video after I read a practice test question, attempt to solve it on your own, and then resume playing the video to check your solution. In the description of this video, I'll include a link to a free two-page study guide for Mechanical Comp. So if you want to read through that, that would be a good idea. Finally, I want to say this. Most of this stuff is common sense. Uh, the formulas you need to know to perform basic calculations are covered in this video. Uh, don't spend more than a few hours studying for this test. And as you can imagine, I'm also going to post maybe 15 shorts videos to supplement the content in this video as well. So with all that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started with these practice test questions. This first question says gear A is the driving gear. If all the teeth are sheared off of gear B, which gears will turn? So since gear A is the driving gear, that means it's connected to a drive shaft, which is connected then to a motor. So as long as the motor turns and gear A is still connected to it via a drive shaft, gear A is always going to turn. That said, if the teeth on gear B shear off, we can see that gear A and gear B mesh together. So gear A turns gear B, and in turn, gear B turns gear C. So if there are no teeth on gear B, A can't turn B, and B can't turn C. So these two are no longer going to turn. So the only one that will turn is gear A, given that it's connected to a motor via a drive shaft. Number two says a series of four gears, W, X, Y, and Z, is driven by a pulley V and a belt. If V turns in the direction shown, which gears will rotate clockwise? So clockwise means the direction in which the hands of a clock move. You can see it's right there. If we look at gear V, we can see that it's moving counterclockwise. If we follow the pulley, we can see it comes around and spins gear W this way, which is clockwise. I'm going to put a C above that to indicate that gear W is spinning clockwise. Uh, we can see that this is spinning gear X this way, which is counterclockwise. Uh, gear X is spinning uh, gear Y this way, which is clockwise. And finally, gear Y is spinning gear Z this way, which is counterclockwise. So as you can see, only gear Y and gear W are spinning clockwise. So this one is uh, Y and W. The answer choice is B, of course. Number three says a box sits on a smooth table. If three strings are attached to the box, each having a weight of 10 pounds attached to the other end, in which direction will the box move? So we can see that there's a weight attached to the box at direction A as well as direction C. A and C cancel each other out. So the box is not going to move either in the A or C direction. We could see that there is a weight in the D direction, uh, but there's no weight in the B direction. So in other words, this weight that doesn't have a counterweight over here at B is going to pull the box off the table this way in the direction of D. So this one is D, D. Number four says four weights are tied together and hung from the roof. What will the tension be at the point labeled? So we're talking about the point X. I'm going to draw a line here so it's very clear as to which weights are above and which weights are below X. To calculate the total tension at point X, all we have to do is add up all these weights that are below X. So that's going to be 30, 20, and 10. You should be able to do this one mentally. Uh, 30 and 20 is 50 plus 10 is 60. So the tension at point X is 60 pounds. Let's say I asked you to calculate the tension at, and let's say I called this point Y. Again, you would find all the weights that are below point Y, notably 20 and 10, and you would say there are 30 pounds of tension at point Y. So again, just find the point, add up all the weight that is below that point. Number five says a spring will compress one inch for every 50 pounds of force that is applied to it. 
how much force is needed to compress the same spring 10 inches. So we're gonna use a proportion to solve this one. Again, according to the problem, the spring will compress one inch for every 50 pounds of force that is applied to it. This is gonna be equal to the 10 inches of compression that we want over X pounds of force. We're gonna be solving for X required to make it compress 10 inches. Again, you solve proportions via cross multiplication. One times X is one X, one X is just X. Uh, 50 times 10 is 500. So in other words, it's gonna take 500 pounds of force to compress that spring 10 inches given this ratio here. Number six says a spring is compressed against a wall by a wooden block that has force applied to it. If the force is removed from the block, what will happen? So here's our diagram. We have force being applied to this block. Of course, we know that that is gonna compress this spring, that is make it shorter, as you can see down here. It's not gonna move left because again, we have this wall here that it's connected to. That said, uh, if the force is removed, uh, we can see that the spring is going to return to its uncompressed state, which means it's going to move to the right. And at the same time, as this spring uncompresses, uh, this block is also going to move to the right. So this one is D, the block of wood and spring will move to the right. Number seven says the illustration shows an example of, so we're talking about this uh, illustration right here. In physics, this is called an inclined ramp. So you just have to know that this is an inclined ramp. Again, in that study guide, they go over what pulleys, uh, wedges, and simple machines are. So please read that study guide when you get a chance. Uh, you just had to recognize that this is an inclined ramp in this case. Number eight says a book is placed against a wall. If the book slides down the wall at a constant speed, what two forces are acting on the book? So again, we're talking about the book moving vertically and the two forces we have to be aware of are friction. Again, the book is gonna be rubbing against the surface of the, of the wall, which is friction as well as gravity. So this one is D, friction and gravity. Number nine says, when these objects are placed on soft sand, which one will sink the deepest into the sand? So think about real world objects to help you with this one. Uh, when you go to the beach, for example, you're probably going to have a beach ball with you. And when you set that beach ball down on the sand, it really doesn't sink into it at all because it has a big surface area coming in contact with the sand. Likewise, if you had a cooler here and you set that cooler down on the sand, again, it's likely not to sink in the sand given how much surface area it has in contact with the surface of the sand. Uh, this has a flat base like a cooler, so it's not likely to sink. That said, when we look at A, let's think about this like an umbrella that we're going to stick into the sand. An umbrella typically has a very sharp point, and uh, that sharp point, which has a very small surface area, is going to go right into the sand the deepest. So this one is going to be A. Uh, A will sink the deepest into the sand. Number 10 says a belt passes over a drum and its ends are connected to springs. If the drum rotates in the direction shown and there is friction uh, between the drum and the belt, then. All right, so this drum is turning this way according to our diagram here. So that means it's gonna be pulling this spring this way. So this spring is gonna be expanding this way. And at the same time, to keep this tension on this belt, this spring is gonna be compressing. That is, it's gonna get smaller. So spring one is gonna get longer and spring two is gonna get shorter. Let's see where that is. Spring one will get longer, spring two will get shorter. So this one is B. Number 11 says the gears in this gear train each have the same number of teeth. If gear A turns at 300 RPMs, revolutions per minute, how fast will gear C turn? So if all these gears have the same teeth, they all have the same gear ratio. That means if gear A spins at 300 RPMs, gear B is also gonna spin at 300 RPMs, and gear C is also gonna spin at 300 RPMs. The answer to this one is C. 
as you'll see in just a minute, we're going to calculate different gear ratios and see how that affects how fast different gears turn. So uh, just sit tight. We'll get to a different example. But this one is to point out the fact that if the gears have the same number of teeth, they're going to be spinning at the same rate. Number 12 says a filled water tank is placed above an empty bucket. A hose filled with air is placed in both the tank and the bucket as shown. What will cause the water to flow from the tank to the bucket? So think about this one in terms of a real world example. Have you ever siphoned gas out of a gas tank? Well, of course, you put a hose in the gas tank and you put the end of that hose in your gas can. But in order to get this gas flowing from the tank to your gas can, you have to first evacuate the air out of the hose. And that's the same thing here. Again, there's air in this line. In order to get this water flowing freely from this tank to this bucket, you have to see evacuate the air from the hose. So this one is going to be C. Number 13 says, what is the ratio of the driven gear to the driving gear? So don't pay attention to any of this except for this formula. That's what we need. Uh, so we're going to do the number of driven gear teeth. We can see that that is 80 over the number of driving gear teeth. So we have 40 driving gear teeth. And this gives us our so-called gear ratio. Uh, cross out these corresponding zeros, of course. Uh, four and eight have a common factor of four. So let's reduce this by four. Eight divided by four is going to be uh, two. Four divided by four is one. Uh, so their gear ratio is two to one. This one is going to be B. It's not one to two because, again, uh, we're doing the ratio of driven gear to the driving gear. Number 14 says, in this pulley system, what force must be applied to balance the 10-pound weight? So here is our 10-pound weight here. And we want to know what force we have to apply. That is uh, the force we're going to apply right here to balance this 10-pound weight. Well, as it happens, this pulley system is an example of a simple 2-to-1 advantage gun tackle system. Uh, so our weight is 10. That means it's... Uh, going to be distributed evenly between this tension point and this tension point. So there's going to be five pounds here, five pounds here. That means it's going to take you five pounds of force to balance this 10 pound weight. So this one is A. Again, I would recommend that you know uh, how to calculate simple two to one advantages uh, in pulley systems. Again, you take the weight, you divide it by two, and then that's how much force you need to balance the weight. Number 15 says, what would you tell the person who's trying to loosen the rusty nut with a wrench? Uh, so in this case, you have to understand how uh, the length of your lever arm uh, impacts how much torque can be applied. Uh, the longer the lever arm, the more torque you can apply. In other words, and we're looking at this uh, diagram right here. In other words, the longer your lever arm, the less amount of force you have to apply to that lever to generate uh, the same amount of torque. So let's say we're trying to get this nut uh, loosened right here. If we put our hand here on the wrench, it's going to take us a force of 20 pounds uh, to loosen this nut. And as you can see, it's one foot away from the nut. That said, if we were to take our hand and put it all the way toward the back of the wrench, that is two feet away from it, you can see it's only going to take us 10 pounds of force to loosen this nut. So uh, for this person here, we would tell them to move your hand further from the nut. B. Number 16 says, if gear A turns at two RPMs, how fast will gear B turn? So the first thing we want to calculate is their gear ratio. Again, this one has 36 teeth and this one has 18 teeth. Their gear ratio is going to be 36 over 18. Again, both of these have a common factor of 18, so let's reduce them by 18. Uh, 36 divided by 18 is 2. Uh, 18 divided by 18 is 1. In other words, the gear ratio is 2 to 1. In other words, for every one rotation this one makes, uh, this smaller gear is going to make two rotations. 
expectations. Make sure I spell that right here. Um, so let's use a proportion to solve this one. Again, the gear ratio is two to one. That's going to be equal to, well, we know uh, gear A is spinning at two RPMs. And we know that this one rotates once for every time this one rotates twice. So we're going to put that two RPMs down here. We don't know how many RPMs this one is spinning at. And now we're just going to solve this proportion with some simple cross multiplication. One times X is just X equals two times two, four. So if this one's spinning at two RPMs, this one must be spinning at four RPMs. Again, that's revolution, revolutions per minute. So this one is C, four RPMs.